Okay, I'm leaning into the microphone here um, uh, uh, to talk with uh, my friend Gregory Kirk, who's an ancient philosophy professor at Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff, Arizona. Um, Greg, maybe you could tell us first uh, where you did your undergraduate degree. Sure. I, um, the short version of things is that I did my undergraduate degree at the University of Toronto. But that was a second attempt. I actually dropped out of school when I was at the appropriate age and went back when I was in my mid-20s. Oh, yeah. Uh, what about your graduate school? Um, I did my master's degree at the University of Guelph. That's where I uh, met your professor. And I did my PhD at Stony Brook University. In uh, New York. New in, in, in New York State, near, near New York City, but just outside of the city on Long Island. Yeah. Um, why did you drop out of your uh, first BA? Uh, I didn't know what I was doing. I liked my philosophy course. I, I sort of enjoyed other things about being a student, but uh, uh, I don't know. I wasn't, I wasn't interested, and I didn't think I was going to do anything uh, academically. I wanted to be an actor, and so I decided to take a stab at that. And, uh, you know, I did that for a few years, and then I got back into academia. Why, um, why did you come back? Uh, yeah, that's it. So I came back to academia because I thought I wanted to write a book, uh, a novel, with a character who was a philosophy professor. <laughs> and so I thought, I'll take some classes and see what it's like, but also do some you know, research for, uh, becoming, for, for learning about uh, how uh, philosophy professors are, get ideas for the book. And then, uh, I guess in the first, first semester, I took an English course which did um, literary theory, and we read a bunch of philosophers, and that uh, uh, got me into philosophy again. Right on. Um, I also know you spent some time um, kind of bumming around Europe or something like that. I did, um, yeah. what, uh, what was your favorite city when you were over there? My favorite city when I was in Europe, uh, I think it's a tie between Barcelona and Prague. Those were the two cities that were the most exciting for me. They're both very beautiful cities. And uh, uh, Barcelona was unpredictable and lively. And uh, Prague, to my, I guess, 22-year-old eyes, seemed the most different. So this would have been in the late 90s. And it still had the slightest hint of the uh, Iron Curtain there, which made it quite interesting to me. Um, you were supposed to teach in Prague uh this fall. That's right. One of the one of the consequences of the um, uh, global pandemic is I'm not going to have the opportunity to uh, spend ancient a semester Prague. living in Prague. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, so um, we should talk about ancient philosophy since that's what they're studying. <laughs> um, uh, so you, I mean, ancient philosophy is a you're not just it's not it's not just a field of research for you. It's I mean it's a big part of your life. Mm -hmm. Why can you start there and say something about why? ancient philosophy is so important to you or how it's important to you how it's important to me. yeah um i mean i have i have reasons uh and the reasons mostly are a little bit retrospective what i mean by that is uh i came to it for other reasons but then later came to appreciate the value of ancient philosophy um uh, a little bit differently um one of the most important ideas in philosophy for my education uh, when I was an undergraduate student. One of the ideas that uh, really made me think this applies to everything, applies to my life, and uh, changes things is um, the idea in Book Two of Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, where he talks about how uh, our, our ability to live well is informed by our our habits, the habits we develop in our actions, and that this started out in our earliest actions from our earliest childhood. And it just seemed so significant to me because it made, uh, you know, moral or ethical questions um, uh, not just rational things, not rational deliberation, but something about um, who, who I am or who you are and how you've lived. And so, and so, uh, not only that, but those habits would then go on to um, uh, inform how you uh, interpret the world, how you make decisions about how you live. And so, so uh, that made a huge impact on me. 
And that was one of the moments when I was taking my introduction to my ancient philosophy course at University of Toronto. That was a significant moment for me. Um, I think re so, th so that moment uh, established for me that I wanted to study ancient philosophy. Uh, however, um, I, d I also think that um, uh, you know philosophy, like other disciplines, but significantly more than, than other disciplines, perhaps because of its long duration, is connected with its history. And uh, what's so important about ancient philosophy, ancient, the philosophy of ancient Greece, and in particular um, the Athenians of um, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, is that they were um, approaching the same kinds of philosophical questions that we consider without nearly the same degree of benefit. They had their own history too, and they were aware of their history as well. But uh, if, um, it's like approaching the questions that are most relevant to you um, in fresh uh, language, free of, of the baggage of, of history. So that's yep. another reason why. Um, it's interesting that you, s you identified something in Aristotle as uh, the, the, real, the thing that really moved you when you were an undergraduate student, and yet you've gone on to focus your studies on Plato primarily. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about what, what you think is philosophically exciting about Plato? Yeah, absolutely. So, so uh, there are lots of important and profound uh, ideas and arguments in Plato, uh, but the thing that's most exciting about uh, studying Plato is um, the, uh, uh, the fact that you're not uh, encountering a person trying to, an, trying to advance an explicit position uh, for you to assess. Uh, as you probably all know at this point, uh, Plato wrote almost exclusively in dialogue form, and anything else he wrote consisted of long speeches by characters. And so you don't know what Plato thinks. That's significant in itself. Uh, but uh, uh, when, I, when I read Plato still, but especially when I, when I started out, um, it was never all that clear what I was supposed to think. And um, I had to um, do some of that work for myself. Uh, by contrast, um, almost everything you get in the history of philosophy and almost all the philosophy classes that I took and almost all of the um, you know, philosophy classes that I know uh, my colleagues and my peers in philosophy teach are about making arguments, advancing arguments, assessing arguments. And uh, so... Uh, you're put in a position where you're told, here's what so-and-so says. What do you think? And then you read it, um, assessing it, thinking, do you persuade me or do you not persuade me? And Plato doesn't do that. Uh, uh, to the contrary, uh, as you uh, told uh, me when I was uh, studying Plato with you as a graduate student, um, in some respects, reading Plato is like reading Shakespeare. You're going to have ideas, you're going to have dynamics between people, and uh, you're going to be moved to have opinions and attitudes towards those things. Uh, but you're not um, uh, prompted about what, your, uh, what, what to think about it. You have the responsibility imposed on you uh, to do that work. Now, having said that, one of the things that makes it very difficult to, uh, as speaking as a teacher, to teach Plato, is that students, many students, and um, you know, you might correct me if you if you think I'm wrong here, uh, many students um, have, I don't know, maybe been trained to anticipate that they need to either agree or disagree with what's being said, and moreover, have heard things about what you get from Plato. Uh, and so a lot of the work of, of, of coming to reading Plato well comes from stripping away the layers of assumptions that people have, both in their training as readers and in their, um, uh, the, the things they've heard about how to ex what to expect yeah. from Plato. Yeah, so it's, it's interesting. You know, you were saying that one of the things about the ancient Greeks that's different from us is that they could come at these problems 
kind of fresh, whereas we have this baggage. And you're saying essentially the same thing about people studying Plato. Good, they, yeah. they, it's, a hard, it's hard for people to study Plato fresh because they've already heard too much garbage. That's right. That's right. And you almost want to, of course, this is impossible, but one's almost tempted to try to um, get students to read Plato like the book's just been published. Like, you, yeah. you, the, you know, Republic has just come out and now you've got to read through it and sort, sort through what you think about it on your own. Yeah. Um, so you, the thing you're stressing about Plato is the way it's written, and you're talking about how uh, provocative and, and engaging and educational that can be. But I wonder if there are also any particular ideas or, or themes or things that you've taken from your study of Plato. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're in particular looking at the Apology and the Republic, and I wonder if, if any, anything in those works um, has had a significant you know resonance for you or has, yeah. has been has been meaningful in your own thinking yeah certainly um so um there's a there's a lot to talk about in both the apology and the republic there's so many things in there that are um powerful and important um i guess the first thing that i um uh try to convey i often i often t i'm thinking of this from a teacher's standpoint here um but i often uh teach uh, the apology near the beginning of a, of a semester where we're studying uh, either an introduction to philosophy or an introduction or a, a course on ancient philosophy and um, I guess the thing that I like to um, draw out um, and get people to talk about is the fact that Socrates um, presents himself uh, portrays himself in his speech as somebody um, uh, well, first of all, as someone um, who's uh, committed, yeah. who's um, uh, made a commitment to living in a certain way, um, who, not only that, but also somebody who believes that uh, if you are committed to something, you should be able to talk about why you're committed to that thing and um, uh, listen to critical feedback from other people, uh, scrutiny of other people. Um, and I had a third thing, I had a third thing too. Um, yeah, so, so, uh, well, I mean, this is, this is, you will no doubt encounter the line, um, it's translated in different, pla in different ways in different texts that the unexamined life is not worth living. Well, uh, that's an extraordinary claim. Um, it's, it's so familiar and you've, uh, people have heard it, um, uh, been exposed to it in their lives before probably, but, uh, what that means is that you need to devote your, there's something you need to devote your life to because you're a human being. And I think that's, a, that's an incredible, um, uh, on, on the one hand, an incredible idea that is, uh, you know, a sort of uh, clarion call for people, but also uh, an extraordinarily demanding one. And um, uh, one that requires people to adopt a seriousness towards their lives that they might be unaccustomed to, yeah. um, uh, and not, I don't mean that. I don't mean that uh, to refer explicitly to people who are, you know, 19 or 20 years old or 18 years old at, in university, but people in general in our world. So, yeah. mm -hmm. what about uh, what about? Well, well, actually, let me say something else about that because it's interesting that there, the apology focuses pretty uh, unambiguously on the character of Socrates, mm -hmm. who who. Um, uh, fits that description you're just saying. So there, I guess you're saying, you know, you learn a lot from him, from yeah. learning about his character. Um, I wonder about the Republic, uh, mm -hmm. w which is a more standard kind of text from Plato because it's a d conversation, a dialogue yeah. between mm -hmm. Socrates and others. Uh, I wonder what, uh, if there are things, what kind of things you get from that, from that dialogue of Socrates with other people. Yeah, um, there's a, obviously a tremendous amount of uh, material there. Uh, to talk about um, the the most famous thing and the most gripping uh, one of the most gripping images in uh, the history of human uh, literary work is the um, allegory of the cave and I think that uh, one of the things that's so uh, tremendous about that is that it can um, uh, speak to people instantly even if they don't quite have a sense of what it is specifically that uh, um, 
it has to do with the with the rest of that uh, enormous dialogue, or what Socrates is actually trying to get at there. Uh, even even still, at a first reading, it's just a very powerful image about how um, um, we as human beings are are uh, inclined, perhaps by nature, to uh, be preoccupied with what we take to be immediately in front of us. The, in other words, we, we, we're uh, impulsively or compulsively inclined to take for granted that how we're immediately experiencing things, what is of, of immediate value to us, is just what there is. Like we, got, we have the whole thing um, without any, um, any need for reflection or intervention. Uh, and that this is wrong, and uh, we, well, what it is to educate ourselves is to uh, come to recognize that uh, the way we immediately experiencing, experience things is wrong, that it, but that nonetheless, that immediate experience points to something else that we should be paying attention to. Uh, and so I think that that's a particularly powerful yeah. image. There's more to be said about that, of course, yeah. but... Yeah. Uh, um, uh, what, what about in in your own teaching? What do you, um, what's your favorite thing to teach in ancient philosophy? Um, well, I, I, can I say something about uh, some of the problems I find with teaching ancient sure. philosophy? So I mentioned earlier that uh, one of the one of the issues that one of the challenges that um, uh, one faces as a teacher of Plato, who wants to take Plato very seriously in the form in which Plato chose to write is that uh, a lot of the, the process is teaching people not to read Plato the way that they uh, are trained to read. By uh, others. By others, yes. And, uh, and so that makes uh, teaching Plato sometimes sort of frustrating because there's, there's a, an obstacle in my path uh, and in the path of the students that needs to be cleared away. And much of the time we spend is clearing away that clutter so that we can actually get into the material. And so, not, so un, not unrelated to the story of the cave. Absolutely, absolutely, of course. Uh, and so, and so, um, uh, that's important. And you know, I spend in a in an ancient philosophy class, I will always spend five or six weeks of this of a, a semesters um, in the United States are typically about fifteen weeks. So I will spend uh, you know a good third of the of the class studying Plato. Yet it's yet I feel like we don't quite we never quite get we get to the beginning by the end of it. We get to the point where perhaps students would be able to read Plato. Uh, and so I actually don't enjoy uh, teaching Plato as much as I enjoy uh, teaching Aristotle. And um, uh, there are obstacles uh, in the way of teaching Aristotle too. Specifically, the uh, the way that Aristotle writes is, uh, qu you know, quite a bit drier and sometimes uh, a little patchy. And uh, if students have just recently been reading Plato, who writes beautifully, uh, this can be a hard adjustment to make. This is a very familiar thing that everybody says. But um, but uh, I love teaching teaching Aristotle uh, because uh, uh, you know he's one of the people who did the most work maybe in maybe in human history to say if we're going to have knowledge how how does it have to be organized probably i mean just just the notion that if we're going to have knowledge it has to be organized is itself a major accomplishment but uh he also did a huge amount of work in doing that and i really enjoy um finding ways to, to uh, put on display what an accomplishment that is for students. And then, and then in addition to that, um, to have them experience somebody who at first they often assume is just, you know, a primitive scientist, uh, discover that this is actually some of the most profound um, uh, set of ideas about nature, about uh, life, uh, about uh, how to live, about uh, how to live with other people, and so on. I mean, you raise you raise something there that I'll ask you about. Um, uh, you know, some people might think, "Well, shouldn't we be studying contemporary thinkers? Mm -hmm. Why? Um, 
why do you choose to study these ancient people when you could be studying you know many much more contemporary thinkers yeah I think there are lots of reasons why uh, so there are reasons why I study it and the reasons why I teach it the reason why I study it I'll, that's what you asked so I'll answer that one <laughs> um, uh, um, there's, there's a lot of reasons. One is that um, it's very uh, very important to experience uh, human beings having been involved in the sorts of things that we're currently involved in uh, thousands of years ago. Right? There's something about that that, uh, um, uh, for lack of a better way of putting it, provincializes um, our intellectual inquiries. Like, we're, we're a part of something much bigger. Uh, and... Um, and it makes, it makes um, the idea that uh, the modern world is the only place in which um, major advancements are made, um, it makes that idea totally, it completely dismisses that notion. Um, it gives people a sense of history. It gave, it's given me a sense of history. Um, and by that I mean a sense of the... Um, ways in which the world that we live in um, emerged. Uh, how this is, in some respects, the product of, you know, accidents of time and so on, but also sometimes, in some respects, the product of decisions people have made, insights people have had uh, going back a long time. So, so it gives, it gives um, uh, uh, a kind of continuity to, um, uh, between our, our world and the past. Um, that point I made earlier about how ancient philosophers uh, don't have a lot of the accumulated um, technical language of, you know, millennia of, of people working on this stuff is also uh, relevant there. There's more, too. Uh, well, let me ask something else. Like, do, do, you, um, do you think those ancient ideas have been superseded by contemporary ideas, or do you think... Those ancient thinkers have something, ideas to contribute to contemporary life? How, how would you, what would you say about that? Yeah, absolutely. So they absolutely do have things to contribute to contemporary life. Um, I've, there, there are people who have made um, profound uh, contributions, to, for example, to the kinds of ideas that Aristotle has in his ethics, developing and articulating things um, on the basis of the insights that he had. But there, but people are still writing in very much in his uh, tradition now. Um, uh, yeah, it would be uh, um, a thing people say in philosophy. Um, you know, I don't know what the value of it is. Is that um, is that uh, Aristotle's ethics is one of three or four major uh, approaches to ethics that are still vibrant today, and his is his is you know more than two thousand years old. Uh, so there's that. Um, um, uh, yeah, I think that, to, so an another way of putting it is, um, or another example that I would give, is that uh, um, there are things that Plato and Aristotle in particular, um, along with other um, uh, thinkers from um, ancient Greece, uh, the thing, there are things that they have to say that put them at odds with um, the sort of modern scientific uh, framework that we're um, a part of, and that um, attend to things in a way that's quite different from the way that we do. Um, they tend to, in particular Aristotle, I suppose, tends to um, uh, emphasize, you know, the phenomenon of life uh, unfolding over time in nature um, according to its own uh, principles. Um, Rather than, um, uh, I don't know, like a, like a, uh, you know, in, in the modern in modern science, the emphasis being more on, uh, on, um, you know, controlled experimentation about uh, uh, the material components of reality and so on. So, in other words, um, uh, Aristotle's philosophy um, is. Uh, grounded in life, I suppose, which um, uh, you don't find very much in uh, uh, to be a thing you find in modern science. And it's just an interesting 
uh, not just an interesting, but a, but a vital thing to uh, read and study Aristotle to uh, think of reality from the standpoint of life. So yep. and that's just my example. And what, so that's Aristotle. What, what do you think about... Well, I guess you could take this up in two ways. I wonder if there are ideas from Plato in particular that you think of as particularly important ones for contemporary oh, life, yeah. maybe mm -hmm. correctives to contemporary ideas. Uh, I also wonder uh, what you see as the relationship between the, the sorts of things Aristotle says and the sorts of things Plato says. Mm. So I wonder if you have Boy. any any of that stuff. Yeah. So the relationship between Plato and Aristotle is tough, um, tough to articulate, because um, it's hard to articulate what what um, what Plato, uh, what Plato's committed to. But um, let me think about that for a second. Um, well, the, the you know there's a there's an idea in Plato which is uh, fundamental, which is that uh, the the fundamental. Uh, force in in reality the fun what what lies beyond being in reality is good uh and so um there's a uh there's a, that's a striking idea the idea that um uh, reality comes from goodness in some sense of that term uh uh, actually getting into what that means is very, very difficult uh, and might not be something that I'm equipped to do at the moment. But uh, um, and so, and so that, that's, that's something that's very much at odds with, with the modern world. Uh, there's a kind of m fundamentally moral character to being. Being, stra being is... is, is uh, emanates from the good and we this is the allegory of the cave again we uh, need to find our way back to the good see, I guess to see how reality is shot through with with goodness and indeed um, has it has it it's being come from goodness that's a that's an idea that's um, uh, in one respect, um, invigorating, and in another respect, um, challenging. Challenging to the way that we experience reality, uh, uh, as well, many of us, I suppose, experience reality in the, you know, modern secular world as, uh, you know, the rubbing together of material components, some of which accidentally became uh, alive, some of which accidentally became uh, aware, and that's it. Um, uh, and, and what about uh, what about advice? Got any advice for people studying ancient philosophy? Yeah. Studying it for the first time? Um, well, <laughs> uh, trust me that Aristotle's worth uh, studying. Oh, you're not doing you're not doing Aristotle. You're studying we'll, Plato. We'll do Plato and Aristotle. Oh, you're going to do some Aristotle. So so. Um, you know, to, uh, trust that Aristotle will be worthwhile, despite the initial shock of reading uh, somebody um, laying out dry, prosaic um, uh, technical language. And, uh, um, you know, m trust yourself to figure out what you think about what's going on in Plato as you're reading it and don't assume that any of the uh, things people say or behaviors they exhibit are just accidental window dressing. It all matters. Plato is an extraordinarily careful writer. He's got a reputation for having, you know, obsessed over how to begin the Republic over the course of his entire life, for example. Um, so, so it's all it's all worth paying attention to, and be creative about it. It's that's where that's part of what makes reading Plato fun. Good enough. Okay, I'll turn this off. Thanks. Thank you. Bye bye.